Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, in the previous lecture, I give you your first taste of how complex things can get when you start looking at higher dimensional systems. Right, the Lorenz system is way more complicated than anything that we have seen so far for planar dynamical systems. We don't have things like the poincare ben dixon theorem. We don't have Dulocq's criterion. We do have things like Lyapunov functions, but they're still very, very hard to work with. Right? So three dimensions and higher is really the wild west in dynamical systems. Things get very complicated very fast. But fortunately, we have a method of trying to understand these systems that can help us to translate the dynamics from a continuous time uh, model where we're sort of moving through a very high dimensional phase space into a discrete time iterative scheme. And in fact, this is named after one of those names we've heard over and over and over again in this class, Henri Poincaré. Now, what we're going to talk about in this video is Poincaré sections and Poincaré maps. And this is why I think that Poincaré is one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. He is certainly my favorite. And in particular, Poincaré maps are a major focal point of my own research. So of course I have a vested interest here. But Poincaré, you know, he was around in the, the late 1800s, really doing his most prolific work. And he was looking at systems that turned out to be chaotic. But he didn't have computers. You know, even Ed Lorenz had computers in the 60s. Poincaré had nothing like that. But nonetheless, Poincaré was just a genius. He had great ways of trying to understand high dimensional dynamical systems using just pencil and paper methods. And one of those methods has lasted to this day. It is what is called a Poincaré mapping. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to consider a general dynamical system in n dimensions, okay? So again, I just stepped up the complexity massively from where we began this class, right? So in n dimensions. So what do I mean by a system in n dimensions? I mean, essentially, x is a vector in Rn, and f is a function from Rn to Rn. So this can be in any dimensions. It could be in 2, it could be in 3, it could be in 5, it could be in 50 million. Doesn't matter, right? The principle remains. So this is how you're, I'm going to show you how you can analyze high dimensional systems. And the way that Poincaré came up to analyze these systems is he introduced what's called a surface of section. So S for section is going to be an n minus one dimensional, one less dimension than the phase space, dimensional surface of section. Okay, so new, new words for our vocabulary here. And really what this means is it's going to be basically a, a hyperplane that I put into the phase, play, uh, the phase space that trajectories pierce, that they go through. They have to intersect it transversely. So here's what I mean. Let me give you sort of the standard sketch that people use for um, Poincaré sections. Okay, so this surface of section sometimes is just called a Poincaré section as if we don't have enough named after Poincaré. But again, if we're going to name anything after him, certainly the Poincaré section gets, gets my vote if we can only have a couple. The basic idea here is this is in my whole n-dimensional phase space. Remember, we think about trajectories in this space. These are parametric curves that move and wind throughout space. And so what we would think of is if I started in the section, so let me call this, uh, say, x0. This is my original spot where I started. Maybe I would fly out of the section. I would go around and do something weird, whatever happens, and I come back around the back, and then I pierce the section again. And I'm going to call this next point x1. And then I go out the front, and I go around, I do whatever I want, and I come through, and then I pierce the section again, and I come back out and around. Okay, so whenever I'm talking about a surface of section or a Poincaré section, it is going to be what we call transverse to the flow. Essentially, this is like a knitting needle. 
It has to pierce it and go right through it. I can't come up and just kiss it and walk away. I gotta go right through the section. So there is an art to defining surfaces of sections. But what I want you to notice here is that I've got a big long trajectory winding through phase space. And really what I'm doing is I'm collecting data every single time I hit the section. Right? I started in the section at x0 and then I collect x1. And then when I get x1, I collect x2. And I could look for the next intersection. That could be x3. And then I could get x4 and x5 and x6, right? So what I actually am going to get here is what's called a Poincaré map. Okay, so a Poincaré section going with a Poincaré map. This is going to be a function p in, in honor of Poincaré, from the surface back to itself, from S to S, and it's obtained, so obtained by following, so by following uh, trajectories from one intersection intersection with S to another. Okay, so again, a Poincaré section would say that if I started at X0, the, the Poincaré map would give me X1. It would also say that if I was at X1, it would I would put X1 into the Poincaré map and I would get X2. So the Poincaré map doesn't care how long you take to get back. It loses all of that information. You can go, you know, do all kinds of crazy things. It just wants to know where you came back to in the section. And so essentially what this gives you is it gives you a way of at least theoretically generating a sequence of successive approximations or, or sorry, intersections with the Poincaré section. Now, again, the Poincaré section is lower dimensional than the original phase space, and it has less information. I don't have to worry about where I went. It's just single points intersected here. So the, what the Poincaré map offers you is it, a way, it offers you a way of tracking complex trajectories, but in this lower dimensional space, right? And it allows you to sort of do it with a reduced amount of information. Now, Let's think about some interesting things that could happen with this function. I would like to know what a fixed point of the function is. Okay, so I've talked a lot about fixed points of uh, dynamical systems, continuous time dynamical systems. I also have fixed points of Poincaré maps. So what would be a fixed point here? Well, think about it in continuous time. Fixed point means that uh, the derivative, the time derivative is equal to zero. It means I, I stay constant. It's a constant solution. So what would a fixed point of a mapping be? It's a constant sequence. It is a point that goes into the map and comes right back out. So we would say that x star is a fixed point of p if p of x star is equal to x star itself. If I put x star in, it comes right back out. Let's ask ourselves what that means in terms of the Poincaré section. Well, that would be, for example, let's pick a spot. Let's try and not clutter my picture too much. You know what? Let's make a whole new picture. Here's my surface of section, my Poincaré section. Imagine I've got a fixed point, x star. So that means that if I started here, I flow out and away, but because the Poincaré map says I come back to the same spot, it says that when I come back to the section after going away, I come back to where I started. So what would that be? Let's draw it. That is a closed orbit, right? So this 
So this tells me that x star is the intersection of a closed orbit. with s. That is very, very interesting to me, right? Because think about what we've done so far. Finding closed orbits is really hard, right? In two dimensions, you have to use like the poincare ben dixon theorem. It's very, very difficult, except for some isolated examples. Whereas now, if I have the Poincaré map, all I need to do is find its fixed points. I find the values of x star that, that under the map go back to themselves. And if I can find those points, they correspond to closed orbits of my original continuous time dynamical system. So already we're seeing a benefit, right? We see how this can help us. Let's actually do some examples. And let's start with really one of the first examples we ever saw with closed orbits. Okay, I'm going to go into polar coordinates as well. So uh, remember, closed, polar coordinates is very advantageous for us. Uh, for understanding closed orbits, especially as a sort of first example. Okay, so we have a uniform oscillator in the phase variable. We have the radial variable here. It's got two fixed points, r equal to zero, r equal to one. We've already seen before that this thing has a closed orbit given by the unit circle in the plane. We've also seen that it's attracting, uh, but let's do the Poincaré section stuff first, okay? So let's set the surface of section, this is going to be the positive x-axis. So positive x-axis, which in polar coordinates is when theta is 0 mod 2 pi. Okay, so again, we're swirling in the vector field, uniform oscillator. So every time we, we go through 0, that's when we track our intersection. It's sort of similar to the fireflies lighting up every time you go through zero, right? That's sort of a version of a Poincaré section as well. Okay, so what I would like to know is that if I, if I have an initial condition, so initial condition, which I will take to be R0 comma zero, which belongs to my section, right, an initial radius and theta equal to zero, then the question is, what is R1? Where do I go to next? So then, uh, so then R1 equal to P of R0, so my, my iteration under my Poincaré map, comes from, well, the way that this has to happen is theta needs to make one full revolution. That takes two pi time units to go all the way around the circle. So I'm actually going to do the same kind of tricks that I did back whenever we looked at bottlenecks, right? So you might have to refresh yourself a little bit on the, the, on the earlier stuff here, but it's all coming back. Remember we had these, these little tricks, right? We took these things and we sort of very trivially turned them into integrals, and then we used substitution, right? So this is one full theta phase. Uh, around the circle. We use substitution to turn these things into integrals in terms of the dependent variables. So starting from R0, going to R1, and just integrating one over the R vector field. And in this case, I'm going to leave this for you to have a little bit of fun with. Okay, so you can evaluate this and you can isolate for R1. So isolating for R1. Again, this is good. This is a nice exercise for you. Even if you have to use maybe Wolfram to help you, you know, evaluate out uh, this integral, have a little bit of fun with this. Well, essentially what this gives you is R1 is equal to, so here's an ugly little formula, one plus e to the minus four pi, and then R naught to the minus two minus one, okay, so it's, it's a really, really ugly formula, but it's completely, you know, evaluable, if that's even a word. So that tells me that if I start at R naught, I go to R1 to find by this formula. It's ugly, but what does that mean? That's my Poincaré map. 
right? If I start anywhere in the section, since this was arbitrary, R1 is the iteration under my Poincaré map. So here it is. So let's just write it out for a second. Uh, this is, you know, this huge, ugly square root. Uh, R0 minus 2, sorry, minus 1 and then all under a square root, okay? So it's an ugly, ugly, ugly function. But again, I'm gonna leave it for you to check for yourself that this thing has two fixed points. If you put, uh, sorry, there's no R naught anymore, it's just R. Um, if you put R equal to zero into this thing, technically this is gonna be well-defined. You might have to do it in the limit, but that's okay. You took calculus, you know how to do these things. R, P, R, P of zero is equal to zero, that's a fixed point. Uh, and we know that, that corresponds to a fixed point in the original system. Similarly, putting r equal to 1 in here gives you 1 back. This term disappears. You get 1 over the square root of 1. p of 1 is equal to 1. Corresponds to the closed orbit. We can go further. We can map the Poincaré section. Or, sorry, the Poincaré mapping. We can plot it. What does this thing look like? Maybe something a little bit like this. And if we, we would like to know where we iterate underneath this thing, okay? So maybe I started somewhere right around R naught, right here, okay? Well then, that tells me that R1 is right there, but then what I would like to do is I'd like to be able to take R1 onto the x-axis and follow where it goes, right? Because I'd like to know where successive iterations go. Well, the way you can do this is through something that we're going to explore a lot more as we go through this class, uh, as we sort of move towards the final lectures. But this could be done using a cobweb diagram. So instead of going over to the y-axis here, I could go over to the to the identity line, so y equal to r in this case, right? So just the, the regular old, you know, perfect slope of one line. And because this thing intersects, this is at r1 comma r1. So I, I can just follow it down, and that gives me r1 on the x-axis. But then I can also follow it up, and this gives me r2. So then I can follow this over and then follow it up to get R3. And then I follow it over to Y equal to R, up to get R equal to four. And you can see where this is going, right? And in particular, this point of intersection between these two curves, Y equal to R and Y equal to P of R, is exactly my fixed point at one. So if you sort of follow my little ticky-tacky right here, what you can see is that I am approaching the fixed point. I'm approaching the fixed point at r equal to 1. What does that mean in the context of the original dynamical system? I am flowing around in a circle via the uniform oscillator. That means that I keep hitting the Poincaré section, which is the positive x-axis. And every time I hit the positive x-axis, I get a little bit closer to the limit cycle, right? So if I started near the origin, I go around and I come out and I'm a little bit closer to one. Then I go around and come out, I'm a little bit closer to one. I go around and come out and I keep narrowing the gap and getting closer and closer and closer to one. You can do the same thing if you start outside. You come in and you get closer to one. These little cobweb diagrams that we'll talk about a lot in a lot more detail later on in this class are exactly capturing that convergence to the limit cycle, right? This is showing me that I am getting closer and closer to the limit cycle every time I make a revolution in the vector field. Okay, let's look at another example of a Poincaré map. Again, I'm gonna do it in two dimensions because that's where it's relatively easy, but the real value of these things is in much higher dimensions. So here's the example I wanna use. It's an example of a sinusoidally driven uh, RC circuit. Okay, it's a relatively simple dynamical system. X dot plus X is equal to a sine of omega T. 
Okay, so if you've taken a course on dynamical systems or if you've watched my lecture series, uh, sorry, on ordinary differential equations, if you have A equal to zero here, A is a parameter, um, these are both positive values. Um, if this is zero, then this is just a exponential decay to zero. And so really what's happening here is that your system wants to fall back to zero, but it keeps getting driven. Right? It keeps getting forced. You're pumping energy into this system. And so even though naturally it would like to resolve itself, this sinusoidal forcing is pushing the system and driving it a little bit away from its settling in. Okay? It's like whenever you're trying to fall asleep and someone keeps kind of punching you in the arm. Okay? So in this case, I mean, this is actually a non-autonomous system. This is uh, something we haven't really spoken about. Now, if you remember on some of the first lectures, I said that non-autonomous systems, they fall into our framework. They just do so in a sort of weird way. They can be extended to a, a two-dimensional dynamical system. I said that whenever you have a non-autonomous system, you sort of ju just add one to the dynamical system or to the dimension of the system. And that's how you should think about it. So even though this is a one-dimensional dynamical system, the non-autonomous part here makes me really feel or makes me really think that this thing should be considered as a planar dynamical system. And how do I want to do this? I want to set theta equal to omega t, okay? So this is a periodic driving here. I'm going to use a phase variable in order to think about this thing uh, in terms of a, uh, a phase variable, okay? Uh, and then this will get a dynamical system that's planar, minus x, so just pull this over, and then plus a sine of theta, and theta dot is equal to omega. Now in this case, it's a planar dynamical system, but its phase space is a little weird. All right, so the phase space is r, Right? X can take on any value in R cross S1. Right? So S1 is the circle, the phase on the circle. So this is a cylinder. Right? This is the same phase space that we saw for the pendulum. So you just have to be careful you know, when you think about these things, think about what the phase space is. But again, we are going to look at a surface of section or a Poincaré section to be, again, the values when theta crosses zero. So this is gonna be uh, x and theta so that theta is congruent to mo uh, zero modulo two pi, okay? So again, same Poincaré section essentially that I looked at last time, completely different meaning though. And what this is sometimes called, instead of a, a Poincaré map, we would call this a stroboscopic map. And why is it that we call it that? Well, this sinusoidal uh, forcing, what we're doing here is we're essentially tracking what the system looks like after one full forcing period, okay? So you're essentially like strobing the system. You can imagine taking pictures or snapshots of the system after every single driving period, right? So again, I'm falling asleep and someone's punching me in the arm periodically, take a picture of their face, you know, every time the punch lands. Something like that, right? It's a very silly analogy, but it's a, maybe a nice way to think about it. Okay, well, again, we have a, a very simple way of figuring out uh, how long it takes for us to get through one section, right? Because we, this thing has a period of two pi over omega. So what this means is that it takes t equal to two pi over omega uh, time units uh, to return to S. Okay, so just like we had before with the, uh, the, the polar system, again, you have a fixed amount of time before you come back to S. And in this case, these are relatively simple situations that we can kind of handle analytically. Now, also, Again, maybe you don't remember how to do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you to sort of go back and look at my lecture series on ordinary differential equations because you can solve that thing exactly, okay? And I'm gonna tell you what the solution is. 
So the solution to the ordinary differential equation, ODE, this is going to be given by x of t is equal to, so you're going to use variation of parameters here. Again, if that doesn't ring a bell, you might have to go and do some review. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm going to give you the answer. e to the minus t plus c2 sine of omega t plus c3 cos of omega t. And I want you to remember, maybe, that C1 comes from the initial condition. Uh, so that's where you start, what your initial value of x is. Whereas C2 and C3, these are the variation, these are the parameters that are being varied by the variation of parameters method. These things are fully determined by A and omega. Okay? Um, so let's look at this at t equal to 0. I get x of 0 is equal to, so I get c1 and then plus c3. And I'm going to set that equal to some value x0 because what I would like to do is I'd like to say if I start here, where do I go next? My Poincaré mapping is going to give me successive values of x. So it says if I have an initial condition x0, where do I go next? Okay. Now also t equal to 0 that is the same as starting at theta equal to zero. Okay, so again, keep track of all of these little moving parts. Um, and so what this actually means is it means that I can rewrite my solution. I can define C1 in terms of C3 and X0. So I get uh, X0 minus C3. That's just isolating for C1. E to the minus T plus C2 uh, sine of omega t plus C3 cos of omega t. Okay, so what next? Well, the Poincaré map is going to give me x1, which is going to be p of x0, where pardon me, x1 is equal to the solution at 2 pi over omega. It's one period into the future, right? It takes 2 pi over omega time units to go around the circle or to return back to s. That means that to go from the starting in the section to go back to the section, I just track the solution after 2 pi over omega time units. And in this case, I get that, so x1 is equal to, so p of x0 is equal to x1, uh, sorry, x of 2 pi over omega, which is equal to, in this case, I get x0 minus c3, and then uh, times e to the minus 2 pi over omega, so again, just putting 2 pi over omega into this thing. And the sine term completely disappears because it's equal to 0 uh, at, this, at this value of t, and then plus c3. So what that actually tells me is that my Poincaré mapping, or my stroboscopic mapping, if you want to call it that, you know, a lot of people from engineering would refer to this as a stroboscopic mapping. This thing is actually... Okay, let's, let's open this up. Let's collect some variables. x times e to the minus 2 pi over omega. And then plus c3 times 1 minus e to the minus 2 pi over omega. Okay, so I just collected like terms. This is a constant. So what is this actually? This is a straight line. That's not very interesting, right? And in particular, it has exactly one fixed point. So the question is, what does that fixed point represent? Remember, you know, the whole reason that we care about uh, Poincaré maps, at least initially, is to find those fixed points. They correspond to closed orbits in the system. So this thing, you can solve p of x equal to x. I'm going to leave that for you to have a little bit of fun with. 
You can definitely find a solution to that thing for every positive omega. And what that intersection with the Poincaré section represents is a closed orbit in this planar dynamical system. Now, what does that actually represent? That represents a periodic solution to my original uh, ordinary differential equation. So what does this mean? It means that I want to relax and settle down, but then I get pumped up by the sign. So then I jump up and then I relax and settle down and jump up and I relax and settle down and jump up. And essentially this fixed point of this Poincaré map tells you that there's a point of perfect balance where I'm relaxing so nice that, that the, the drive here from the sinusoidal driving is perfectly balancing my relaxing, right? So I relax and then I get pushed and then I relax, I get pushed and I fall into a nice periodic perfect rhythm, right? So this, this is exactly what this fixed point would represent. And in particular, you can show that, you know, if you draw your little cobweb diagram like I did for the previous example, all of the solutions are in the Poincaré section are being driven into this fixed point. So no matter how you start, you always fall into that sort of relaxed oscillation. Okay, when we come back, we are going to talk a little bit more generally about stability of fixed points using Poincaré maps. So I'll see you in the next lecture, everybody.